Hello everybody and welcome back to Promise Gaming and more Democracy 3 Australia, playing on maximum difficulty. <clears throat> Gonna apologize in advance, I think my, uh, I think my throat has gone kind of full sickness mode here. It's kind of sucky, so my voice sounds a bit off. It was starting to happen a bit last episode, now I think it's, uh, I don't think it's escalated a little bit. But anyway, haven't read comments from the last video because I'm recording ahead of time, so I hope people are being nice. I uh, hope that we are having some good, intelligent discussion. That's all that matters to me in the end of the day. We're going into year 10, which is election year in Australia, and the final year of this series. So let's go ahead and begin. There's not a whole lot that I feel like we need to do at this point. We could reduce poverty a little bit, I suppose. Um, I think we should kind of, I think we, what we sh if we should do anything, we should p take some very themed policies and start moving a bit more toward a national socialist playthrough, kind of end this on a, um, I won't say fascist note, but you know, kind of, uh, we're, we're really national socialist, really, really statist approach, you know, that's what we're going to go for. We did get a Nobel Prize though, because we have incredibly high education, we usually will get these from having that, which boosts the GDP slightly, makes the Patriots happy and the Liberals and stuff, which is great. Patriot membership increases because people are so darn proud of Australia. It's amazing. We're making almost $60 billion in surplus right now, which is pretty darn good if you ask me, and the GDP is about to be maxed out. How's the environment? Took a slight dip, but now it's doing pretty good. It's doing all right. It's not so bad. It's not so bad. Um, all right, so what are some things we want to do? Some things that are nationalist. Hmm. And socialist. Nationalist, socialist. <laughs> Well, we did reduce the alcohol law stuff back down to uh, minimum age 21, so the Australians are finally able to start, you know, drinking their alcohol again. I think I am going to boost up state housing a little bit. We don't need to do it a ton. I just need to boost up my equality a little bit. This will give me an extra uh, about 4% or so, with uh, the cost of about $4 billion. Not a huge deal. That'll boost up our equality, hopefully meet our manifesto in the uh, relatively near future. Um... Hmm... One other thing I suppose we could do. What if we did uh, maternity leave? This is something I know a lot of people like to talk about. Very popular politically. Uh, people love the idea of, you know, hey, women are able to go and have babies and then go back to work and stuff, and they still can make a living, and they can finally have it all. They can be mothers and workers and stuff, and blah, blah, blah. Maternity leave's a pretty fun thing. I really hope that someday my own wife is able to have maternity leave. I do... On a personal level, I do question whether maternity leave is something that the government should mandate. I think it's a benefit, right? If, if a company wants to increase benefits in order to attract better workers, that's something they can do of their own volition. I do question whether or not that's the government's responsibility, though. That's my personal belief on this. But otherwise, I mean, yeah, when women have children, they're gonna take some time off. At least I hope they do. And uh, this can be pretty helpful in that sense. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, the downside of ma uh, maternity leave is that it does reduce productivity a fair bit. We did just recently pass the rare earth metal mining, so this is not going to hurt us. And we also do have uh, childcare benefits? No, benefits? Subsidi We're subsidizing daycare, which gave us a huge productivity boost. So they're going to be less productive right when the child is born, and then the child goes off to daycare, i.e. hopefully state-run schools so we can indoctrinate them. And uh, then the productivity goes back up. So it's a wash at the end of the day, but it makes people pretty happy. It makes trade unions happy. A lot of pe parents are happy. It saves them money. Um, we can mandate a few different things. We can mandate a quarter pay. So a woman makes $40,000 a year. We can man the, the government will give her $10,000 a year, basically. Quarter of her salary. Uh, half pay, three quarters pay, full pay, or full and paternity leave. Makes the parents really happy. Productivity goes way, 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 way down. Not sure we really want to go quite that much. Let's just say sl just barely half pay, okay? We want there to still be an incentive for women to go back into the workforce after they have a child rather than take a, a long maternity leave. We want them to get back into work. So half pay seems reasonable. That's a few months of some salary just taking care of your kid. It's all right. It's not that bad. It's okay. Yeah? Yeah, I think so. All right, anything else we want to do? Um, welfare fraud department. We can detect people who are uh, taking advantage of our welfare system. I don't really care that much. Labor Day would make the unions happy. It reduces the GDP, though. Uh, all right, sure. Let's throw a bone. Let's throw a bone out to the uh, to the trade unionists. The big deal about this is it actually increases socialism membership by about five percent. I've always thought that Labor Day is a little bit stupid, though. 
It's one day out of the year that's a holiday, a government holiday, and it reduces the GDP by 2.37% for one day. That seems a little drastic if you ask me. Just a wee little bit drastic, but it's all right. You know, the other thing we're gonna do, let's indoctrinate those kids. I said we were gonna do it before, it was kind of a joke, but now it's not a joke. Let's do a youth politics council and make the kids love me. Maybe they can join special youth programs and governmental associated programs and through their schools and stuff. And it'd be great. I mean, it's not reminiscent of Hitler's youth at all. <laughs> no, I would, I would never do that. No, no. <laughs> Please don't, please don't start spreading around rumors that I'm a Nazi like PewDiePie. Come on, don't do it, guys. Topical references again. I did it. I know. Credit rating upgraded to a double A. Yes, that's excellent. Campaign speeches are now available. We have a $61 billion surplus. What's this from Dick Cheney? The plan was criticized by some retired military officers embedded in TV studios, but with every advance by our coalition forces, the wisdom of that plan became more apparent. What are you talking about? Are you talking about the uh, Iraq War or something? Or maybe this is going back to the days of, like, the first Gulf War, which, to be fair, the first Gulf War is what I look to as, like, a standard for uh, how a military operation for America should work. Kind of just really going in there, very coordinated, hit them fast and hard, bam, done, war's over. And that was a pretty good example of mil uh, American military right there, and how that should work effectively, but... I have no idea what Dick Cheney's talking about there. I haven't paid attention to Dick Cheney in many a year. Which is fine. Um, okay, so we did recently just reduce the GDP with a labor holiday. One thing I could do to try and make up for that is I actually could relax the uh, pollution restrictions slightly. But I don't think I'm going to because the environment is starting to slightly dip down. It's not that I'm worried about getting a water crisis before my uh, election. It's just, let's let's not mess with it, you know? Let's, let's just not. Let's just not mess with it. Uh, one thing I could do, though, is I actually could reduce the carbon tax. We are generating a lot of money out of this. But we already have a massive surplus. We could improve the GDP drastically by doing this. And it's not like the carbon tax actually does anything for the environment directly. It affects CO2 emissions, yes. And CO2 emissions are uh, allegedly very important when it comes to the environment. So let's actually see. No, it actually isn't. It's, it's, the CO2 emissions do nothing right now. That might be because they're at minimum. There are, we, we, do not, we do not emit CO2 in Australia. We don't even breathe. Okay, we, it's just too expensive to do that. But it does make environmentalists happy. It's supposed to impact, like, uh, foreign relations and stuff. So I, I don't know how much I trust this right now, because it's at minimum. But yeah, CO2 emissions and stuff, greenhouse gases, global warming, blah, blah, blah. The exact effect of CO2, I would say, is difficult to ascertain. I, this is going to make some people say that I'm a climate change denier. I'm, I'm not denying the, the changing climate in the United States. or Sorry, not the United States, the globe, the globe in general. I will say it's very difficult, though, to... If, if you're being honest, it's very difficult to assess the exact damage of carbon emissions because there are several different factors that impact global temperatures. I'm not saying that it doesn't work that way. I mean, it makes sense. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, after all. But exactly how much of it impacts that, how much of it is due to mankind, very difficult to mathematically ascertain. So I don't know. Some people, some people just outright reject whether or not CO2 direct, uh, affects the climate. I, I would say that that's just kind of denying basic science. But exactly the impact of it, that's harder to justify, in my opinion. Just because I'm honest about the limitations of our knowledge. We don't, not everything is fully understood when it comes to the climate. So therefore, how can you get a sense of proportion for the, for the carbon emissions? Difficult to do. Not impossible. Can be done. Hopefully will be done soon. Well, someday. But difficult to do. Very difficult to do. National anthems in schools. This does upset the youth, but we're going to make them gosh dang patriotic. So let's make the patriots happy. It seems like a national socialist thing to do. It's fine. Hey, by the way, on the subject of climate change, I don't think I, don't think I asked this in a, in a previous video. Maybe I did and I didn't see any comments about it, but I don't remember. Anyway, I actually, there's something about climate change that's always been bugging me. And I've never, I've, I've, I've always forgotten to look it up, but now I'm remembering. So I'm going to ask you guys. Maybe you guys know. Um, polar ice caps and stuff, right? They're supposed to be melting, at least, uh, uh, debatably. In North American, the, the North Pole is supposed to be melting. Uh, Antarctica supposedly, I think, is gaining some ice, but, um, I, I've seen some, con some, uh, conflicting information on that, so I'm not gonna make a statement on that. But either way, supposing it's all true, though, that the rising temperatures result in the melting of the polar ice caps, which makes sense. The warmer it gets, you know, the harder it is for the ice to, uh, stay together. Got it. Okay. 
People keep saying that the rising tides will be due to those melting ice caps. Why? I, I don't think that makes sense to me. Maybe I'm missing something. I'm sure someone far smarter than me knows, but that doesn't make sense. If you take a cup of water and you fill it up with ice and then the ice melts, you're going to find that the water level in that cup goes down because ice in water expands when it freezes and takes up a greater volume. So when it melts, then it should be con contracting and taking up less overall volume, which means the sea levels should drop, not go up. So what drives that? I've actually never known. I, I keep forgetting to look it up, but I'm like, that's a good question. Maybe it's because like the increased heat in the water makes like the water molecules like expand outward slightly, and then you do that enough for an entire ocean and it goes up a few inches? I'm not sure. But I've never known the answer to that question. It's always freaking bugged me, so maybe someone can tell me in the comment section below. Eh, maybe I'll look it up after this video. I don't freaking know. It could be. All right, what else do we want to do? Um, I am not sure, actually. <laughs> what do we want to do? Anti-gravity research grants. Nah, I don't care about that. Uh, you know what? I'm going to save my DNA and move on to the next turn. We're going to spend it on some other stuff. Because I want to do some very socialistic-y things pretty soon. And I'm going to need the DNA for that. So, DNA? Gosh, I've been playing too much Plague Inc. Political capital. Thank you. Airport expansion. No! You're not allowed to expand the airport. It might ruin the environment. Also, why is the GDP going down? Hey, hey, I reduced the carbon tax. GDP needs to go up. The Labor Day holiday should not be impacting us that much. That's ridiculous. Is it because of the global economy? Well, the global economy is down in the crapper. There's no doubt about that. That, that does kind of suck. All right, well... Either way, we still got about a $50 billion surplus. This is not quite the last turn. So one thing I want to do, and I think that this is going to be not very well received by some of the wealthy, but we are going to cap CEO pay in Australia. And this is actually based off of a uh, economic theory that, well, I'll, I'll just show you guys here. So working the job of CEO is hard, but they're, they're getting paid too much, right? Someone in the company, you know... Uh, the CEO is making millions of dollars a year, whereas their employees are making only, like, $30,000 a year. I sound like Bernie Sanders all of a sudden, but, you know, it, either way. That's just too much. That's ridiculous. The pay, the 1%, oh, that 1%, they're, they're, they're just working off the backs of the poor working classes. Stuff like that. It's a terrible impression, by the way. I'm not even, I, I kind of slipped in and out of that one, so don't, don't skewer me too much over it. So here's what the economic theory is about this. If we put a cap on the CEO pay, uh, uh, multiplier, whereas, so so basically, let's suppose the average employee in, um, I don't know, let's say Apple, makes $40,000 a year, and we imply a 10 times cap on that uh, multiplier. That means that if the average citizen makes $40,000 a year, then the CEO is not allowed legally to be paid more than $400,000 a year. 10 times multiplier cap. Okay. And the idea behind this economically is... Uh, this will incentivize CEOs to pay all of their workers more so that they can get a larger paycheck. Uh, at least that's what I've seen some people say as a justification. Other people think it's just not fair that they get paid that much, and that's that's all there is to it. Some people try to justify it saying, well, this is an incentive to raise wages. I personally think that's a bad argument, because one, it kills incentive. Two, we're not paid based on hours worked, we're pay paid based on productivity. And believe it or not, a CEO does produce a lot for his company. If he did not, then the board of directors would not hire him or pay him as much as they do. Because here's, here's the thing about public companies and corporations. You guys need to understand this. Public corporations are owned by their shareholders. The board of directors has a legal and moral obligation to improve the value and the shares of that company in order to benefit their shareholders. That's their entire goal. And if they just go pay a CEO millions of dollars when he doesn't deserve it and he doesn't bring in more than that amount to the company, then they're losing money and the board of directors can't do that. The shareholders can fight back. At least that's the idea. So if they're going to be paying a CEO millions of dollars, the board of directors has a direct incentive to ensure that this CEO is able to bring in more than that amount of worth to the company. And in that sense, maybe there is something fair about it. I don't know. I mean, I would agree that I personally don't think I would need millions of dollars to do a job, but I don't know. It's not necessarily about that. It's about what you bring to the table. Anyway, we're going to go ahead and just put out, I don't know, let's just say a 20 times multiplier. Maybe just barely 20 times. 
Just wanted to kind of show you guys how this works. It kind of fits with a the theme. I mean, we could do a five times average, but I guarantee you this is going to cause some negative effects. I mean, the wealthy just cease to be wealthy. They become like the middle class slash the poor, but... <laughs> no, we'll just do barely a 20 times average thing. It'll be fine. Capitalists don't like it. Socialists think it's great. The wealthy lose a lot of money. Equality goes up and socialism membership goes up slightly. It's fine. It's not a big deal. It's okay. All right, debt is back down under a trillion dollars. Huzzah! It's still worse than it was when I originally took office, but look at the country. There are no negative events, and we have high productivity and uh, technological advantage. It's pretty good. It's not bad, in my opinion. It's not that bad. All right, what else do we want to do? National monorail system. That's what we're going to do. We're going to pass a monorail. You know, this is always just like one of my big final projects that I do whenever I play Democracy 3. It's like, we got a few billion dollars? Sure, let's set up a big honking commu uh, commuting system. Car usage goes down, commuters love it, unemployment goes down. It's honestly not that good. Like, all the, all the uh, monorail system really does is reduce traffic a ton. If traffic congestion is really, really bad, this helps. It also actually improves the environment slightly because uh, there are less car emissions. You can see here that there is a, a downside to the environment because of the number of cars. So it just reduces the number of cars used. And if that's really important to you for improving the environment or for reducing traffic congestion for the benefit of your economy, then maybe the national monorail is okay. Otherwise, it's really just a glory project. I, I don't really think it's that useful. Oh, look, a food price crisis, but it's not the negative event, so it's okay. Manifesto promises are now available. How are we looking as far as the equality? Did we not? Aw, oh, we didn't get we didn't get up there. Oh, that sucks. I'm not going to have successfully fulfilled my manifesto. Well, darn. Um, what I can do is ban second home ownership. Sure. You're not allowed to own a second home. They're totally banned. Screw you, wealthy people. You don't need two houses. You only have to live in one. There we go. That'll boost up equality. It won't be enough. Because we're going to do the election before all the uh, changes to the, to the country take effect. So I don't think we're going to meet this manifesto, which actually kind of makes me sad. A big part of that is the sales tax and the gated communities. I could have reduced the alcohol tax a bit. That wouldn't have been so bad. Maybe I should do that a little bit. All right, let's just re let's reduce the alcohol tax to 30%. Something more reasonable. We're not making much income because no one is drinking alcohol. Let's bring it down to a 20%. There we go. That should make you people happy, right? Um, okay, we only have six political capital left. I don't think there's really much of anything we need to do for electioneering. We could make a couple of pledges to the manifesto. Um, I could promise again to raise equality, even though I didn't do it the first time. Uh, state schools, income tax. I mean, sure, I pledge to cut the income tax. I'm quitting before I do it, so you can't hold me accountable. There we go. Socialists aren't happy about this, but capitalists, the middle income in particular, are thrilled about it. We could also do something about perceptions and do a media stunt. No, we don't have enough. Well, we do have a little bit. Let's invite cameras into my home. Oops, it went horribly wrong. People saw how, what a lavish uh, la lifestyle I have. And that I've, I've, I don't know. I, I don't know. It didn't work. Media spin failure. They're not trusting me at all. The reason trustworthiness is so low is because I flip-flopped on so many positions when I was trying to get rid of the general strike. That's actually one of the features of electioneering that they added into the game. And I... I understand why they do it, and it does bring a certain level of balance. It's also really annoying, though, because when it comes to the climate stuff, like, I mean, in order to beat this, you need to go overboard a little bit in order to finish off some of these negative events. It'd be great if, you know, as we do this stuff, you just sort of magically know this is the perfect moderate amount that will work for the rest of the game, so I never have to raise it up too high and then make some tweaks. And God forbid that you have to tweak things in your game, but... I don't know. It makes sense from a from a balanced perspective. It's just annoying. Anyway, we're out of political capital. That's the end of this. So, let's go on to the election. I expect to get at least 93% of the vote. That said, I imagine perceptions will go against us, and I think our opponents will spend far more than we will. So that's fun. Let's go ahead and pass this. And it's a landslide. Oh yeah. Our ministers are hurting us more than they're helping for some reason, which I just don't appreciate. How dare you. But anyway, 98% It's pretty good. Pretty darn good. Uh, actually, our perceptions worked in our favor. Apparently, trustworthiness is not as important as being a compassionate, strong leader. Fun. We didn't get all, all the liberals and capitalist votes. That makes sense. Self-employed, environmentalist, middle income. Some of this is all right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is a pretty good turnout. There are no ethnic minorities, though. No ethnic minorities in Australia. 
because we banned foreign churches, and apparently all ethnic minorities are foreign religions. I don't know. Changes. Health went up by 52%. Education, crime, that was the big one. Quality is pretty decent. Poverty, down. Environment's looking nice. People are working a little bit less, though. Technology's pretty darn good. Car usage down. Productivity's up. International trade going down does kind of suck. But, you know, that's kind of what happened. We did pass tariffs and a lot of other stuff. I know I retracted those, but... I don't think we ever, uh... I don't think we ever quite outweighed the reductions in international trade we took in the beginning of the game. So, there you go. Foreign relations, pretty good. Poor earnings. Actually, everyone across the board is doing better. Especially the poor. Even the middle earnings with a 60% income tax. Even the middle class is doing better under us. That's pretty good if you ask me. GDP, pretty nice. Tobacco usage, tourism, alcohol consumption, of course. Wages. Wages went up by 23% in 10 years? That's amazing. And our currency is doing really well. This is nice. It's a, good, it's a good playthrough. We did pretty well here. This is on maximum difficulty, guys. Ooh, an elder statesman. Uh, ooh, hey, hey, we got the egalitarian society. Nice, we did it. So that means our equality must be really high now, right? Oh yeah, so it actually it actually did cross that manifesto line. I'm not sure I'm not sure it calculated in time, but it did cross that. Cool. That's we get we got to leave this on a high note. New major party donor. Too late. <laughs> you don't get a you don't get a jump in. You don't get a jump in on this uh this this winning action after the fact. How dare you? But anyway, all right. No negative events in Australia. High productivity. Technological advantage, a free and egalitarian society, super duper socialistic and equal and stuff like that. It's amazing. There was something I wanted to look up, but I forgot what it was. Eh, how are we doing on food prices, by the way? Food prices are slightly coming up, but otherwise they're pretty good. International trade. What's driving this down? Currency strength. Oh, that's interesting, actually. The stronger our currency is, uh, the less purchasing power we have for international trade. There is there is some economic theory about this, that devaluing your currency makes it easier to switch toward a more export-based market, but... I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. Pretty good across the board, everybody. Pretty darn good, if you ask me. And this was on maximum difficulty, and we came out pretty well. We had our rocky patches, no doubt about it. We had our problems in Australia, but we won... And I think I'm proud of that playthrough. Thank you all very much for watching. I do hope that you enjoyed this series and will hit that like button and show your appreciation. I'm not sure when I'm going to be playing Democracy 3 next. I think, honestly, I, I, I think I'm more or less done with Democracy 3 in general. Maybe someday for some streaming, I'll pick up some mods and we'll try some stuff out. Primarily what I'm interested in focusing in on now are some guide videos for Democracy 3. Uh, I don't know when I'm going to release those. I don't have any estimated date, but... Someday I want to put out some videos that goes in depth about how to grow the GDP effectively, uh, how to affect conservative versus liberalism membership, stuff like that. If you think that's a good idea, let me know in the comment section below. As far as I can tell, there are very few people who've done anything quite like that, and I think that uh, I'm pretty experienced in this game, and I, I actually could make a difference and make this easier for everyone with some good guides. So let me know what you guys think about that. Otherwise, I'm going to sign off here. Thank you all very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.